if you could all be seated, please. Thank you. Dear friends, first of all, thank you for making this afternoon so memorable. If you look around the room, there is not, not much seats left in the room, and I wish I had mine. Dear friends, on behalf of the Gold Association, I'd like to welcome you all to the book launch of a Railway Lunch Group. This is a book which is a culmination of years of effort and contribution from various members of our community, which has been successfully project managed by our very own talented Selma Carvalho and a team. I would like to put your hands together for Selma Carvalho. So the applause can be a little louder because I want the other room to hear what Selma Karwal has done for the last few years. So Selma Karwal, <laughs> but well, this project would have not been possible thanks to the generous grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. The Goan community have been very privileged to be able to successfully document the migration of Goans from Africa to the UK. And that will be archived in the British Library for the benefit of future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look around the room, we are among the privileged few to be recognized by the UK government and to be given a grant to conduct such a research is unforeseen. I would all like you to stand for a moment of silence. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. A minute of silence beginning now. I think so. 200 years from now, we can have a go on hamstreet.com. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's for projects like these that makes history, that makes us archive, and it's never lost in memories. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together back again for the lovely work you can see that has been put in this project. They say there is no communication without a voice. The next person I'm going to call upon on stage to speak about is the voice that we all listen to every weekend, whether in the cyberspace. He is the founder and editor of Goan Voice. Everybody wants to know what's happening in the Goan world no matter where you are, no matter where you come from, just just one voice. And ladies and gentlemen, can you guess who it is? There's no guessing. There's only one voice, and that's going voice. And ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together while I welcome Eddie Fernandez to the stage. He's still a few words and his experiences about this project. So ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Fernandez. Thank you very much Ravi for that very flattering introduction. I do wish I deserved it, but uh, as far as the, uh, this particular project is concerned, I think you know, uh, 
voices far louder, far more strident, far more useful than mine. And uh, friends, I'm going to tell you briefly about my involvement with the project and how it got started. Some of you uh, were at the, uh, I know, were at the July 2010 Goan Festival when, uh, when Selma Carvalho launched a book, uh, the Into the Diaspora Wilderness, which was enthusiastically received and all copies were sold out in the day. She had spent two years researching and writing uh, the book about overseas Goans. And in the course of doing so, she met many East African girls here in the UK. She was fascinated by the accounts of making the transition from Goa to East Africa and then to the UK. But he went further than that. He put it before the board and there was enthusiastic support. So it was decided to apply for a grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. Cliff Pereira pro uh, proved to be a gold mine in facilitating that, the application. We were told that the bidding process was very competitive, but we won. Kudos to Selma and to Cliff. After we won the award, we anticipated problems in recruiting volunteers and people to interview, but we need not have them. All the training sessions and seminars were all subscribed, and the target of the people to be interviewed soon reached. However, it has been very hard work. We owe our thanks to the volunteers who attended the training sessions the people interviewed who gave us their time, to the co-team, to Dr. Margaret Friends for guiding us along, to Agnes Costa Correa for helping to put together the video presentation, to Cliff Pereira for steering us through the grant application process and then providing us with his historical perspective. Mervyn Marcial was, a, was stood head and shoulders about the rest as far as volunteers were concerned in helping us out, providing material, contacts, etc. But we are mainly indebted to Selma Carvalho for conceiving the project and mothering it round the clock in spite of the old brick bat and for a pittance in remuneration. For her it has been a true labour of love but it has also been a very trying time, and there have been times when, when we have been at war. Um, and instances when the book was published, and I was quite taken aback not to see her name either on the, on the front cover or on the spine. And, but she insisted that it was a community project and her name is not going to be on the cover. So ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to put your hands together for Selma. Thank you. This project, because it encompasses the diaspora, which is spread across the seven over the seven seas, we needed somebody not only who had the flair of writing, but also who has had an experience across living in those places. We have a diaspora in Dubai, and that's where Selma was born, or spent the best part of her life. And then she moved to the US, spent around eight odd years, and then now in London. But the difference is she is going to the core. And that's what you need to identify yourself, is no matter who you are, what heights you reach, it is always your roots that makes you strong. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Selma Carvalho to say a few words of this marvelous project. Ladies and gentlemen, Selma Carvalho. No, no. 
not talking as yet. <laughs> okay, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for coming. What a marvelous turnout. And I know that some of you have traveled very long distances, so really thank you. I won't keep you for long. My speech is just three pages, but I assure you I've forgotten 50% of it. So I won't keep you for long. The question before us always is, how does a community, how, when is a community forgotten? A commun when do we become smaller, more insignificant, more invisible? A community is forgotten when our stories are forgotten. Today, particularly the God Catholic, has to fight twice as hard to remain visible because we are increasingly asked to integrate with the larger Indian or South Asian narrative. But our story is different from that, and it deserves to be remembered as distinct and unique. When I was researching for this book, I had hardly any information about how Gomes lived between 1860 and 1910. This is when the first wave of migration is happening into East Africa. In a history that spans over one century, we have maybe one, if there's another one, I don't know, book written about East African Goan history, and that is Teresa Alba Keck's uh, Goans of Kenya. Now, scores of books are written by Indian authors about this migration. One of the most definitive books written is by J.S. Mungand. It's a very fairly exhaustive uh, book. And in this book, the longest sentence I could find explaining the history of Gomes was that they were predominant in the provincial administration. Other than that, Mungand has nothing much to add about Gomes. So I turned next to European sources. Maybe Europeans have written about it. Well, invariably, I would come across this Goanese clerk who was working in the offices, who was very helpful to them, or they had met some Goanese who helped them change the tire when they had broken down in some remote part of East Africa. If I was really lucky, maybe I would come across a surname, a D'Souza or a Pinto. I said we were so irrelevant that our first names need not have been remembered. So I had to turn to what in research we call our primary sources. And in this I was lucky, because girls themselves living in 1865 and 1895 had left records for us to find. The manager of the Zanzibar Gazette from 1894 to 1910 until uh, to 1916 when he retired was a Goan, Sima and Sirav was very, and he has about seven other Goans sit, uh, working for him. And Sirav was very, very um, instrumental in getting Goans into the paper. Because if you look at the Sands of Africa said before he joined, and if you look at it after he joined, there's really not a trace. And uh, the Goans of Nairobi between uh, 1900 and 1910 were also prolific letter writers. And they wrote to, uh, to newspapers whenever they had arguments and things like that. And that's a rich trace. And in the National Archives, if you sift through files and files, you'll find traces of those goings. So putting all this information together and the wonderful information I gathered through interviewing you, we have now a book which is about 140 pages of history. And as my editor, Dr. C.S. Christine Nichols, um, said, has said very often to me, uh, this is a historical document. So, having documented this history, what do we know about Goans now? Not that just they were predominant in the provincial administration, which of course they were, but Goans were also fundamental in nation building and they were instrumental in building these towns at the turn of the century in East Africa. They were, they were not only responsible for funding almost all the Catholic churches and schools and missions, but they were also responsible for funding 
infrastructure such as electrical lighting. They were holding benefit shows and, and they were throwing charities for poorer Africans um, in, in these towns. They were the musicians playing in Victoria Gardens. They were the band leaders leading bands. They were writing, they were running printing presses. They were the doctors who treated people for free or accepted a chicken in lieu of payment. They were, um, no European could have survived without Goan retailers. Goan retailers dominated Zanzibar, Mombasa, Nairobi, and then of course Tanganyika and Uganda. They were responsible for supplying the luxury items. They were commission agents and auctioneers, and they supplied labor for the caravans that went into the interior and facilitated trade. All this history is being forgotten because human memory can't remember. And so it, it falls on us to document it. The task of writing our history is never over. We can build on it, and we have to keep on building. And this is where we need more of you to write your memoirs, to preserve your photographs, old letters, and hand them in. We need more people, academics and historians reporting our stories. We need documentaries to be made. We need children's books so that we can pass on the story to our, to our children. We, and the most thing that I wish for, and I sincerely hope that this happens in my lifetime, is that we have a museum to commemorate this narrative. It is a moral imperative as a community to pass on our stories to the next generation so that they grow up with a sense of self-worth and a sense of pride in their past. We're fed up of looking at books and seeing white faces, white heroes look back at us. It's time we saw brown faces that look like us and we celebrate our own heroes. I want to uh, end by uh, thanking everyone who volunteered for the project. And all those names have been acknowledged in the book, so I won't go through all the names. But there are a few people that I really need to mention today. Uh, one of them, no, two of them actually, is Eddie and Lira Fernandez. And uh, really, Eddie, this has been as much Eddie's project as this has been mine. And uh, I can't imagine having sustained myself for three years and brought this project to fruition without Eddie's constant support and assistance. <laughs> the has had to work very closely with me uh, because he's the finance director and he manages the budget. And so Richard and I have had to work very closely on a number of things. And um, also Richard has been very supportive in terms of logistics and general support. Um, Flavio and Bernie Grace Gracias. Flavio has supported this project from the word go, and I'm sure those three or four babies we have had nothing to do with it, much as any of that is to the lead. Ravi Bhatt who took over from um, Flavio as president. Ravi Bhatt's enthusiasm, cheerfulness, diplomacy, and fresh ideas. I don't think I've seen Ravi angry at any time. And Mervyn um, Marcial, many aspects of this project wouldn't have happened at all. Had it not been for Mervyn, who gained access for us uh, to interview the former British ambassador and British commissioners, and who also found a fabulous editor for the book, which is Dr. Christine Nichols. And uh, I have to mention one volunteer who was our star volunteer, which is, who is Agnes Foster, who devoted a lot of her time, and she's here today. Uh, unfortunately, she wasn't there at the, at the um, exhibition, on the exhibition line. And uh, last, uh, I want to thank my husband, Salvio Carvalho, uh, for all the assistance that he's provided, um, chauffeuring me around, all the technical assistance. Had it not been for him, we would have had to hire a technical person. <laughs> And 
also want to the Lord and Sabi for their uh, patience, particularly in the last year when I've had to isolate myself in a room to write the book. It took many, many months away from my family. But just when I thought their patience would run out, they seemed to have found uh, another well of patience. And lastly, I want to thank all the people who let us into their homes, who welcomed us, who served us drinks and snacks and opened up with their stories. And this is really your project. This is your story that I'm telling. There were many more that we needed to record, that we should have, that we wanted to, but unfortunately, resources and time did not allow us. Um, we as British girls have to be tremendously proud of ourselves. We have to pat ourselves on the back because we've achieved something which Canada nor Australia has managed to achieve. We have archived for posterity a part of our heritage and we've documented so much. So thank you. Thank you, Selma, for those insights into the project of those many years of labor and toil, crimes and tribulations. And the people who have supported the outreach, our very own councillor of the Watford Council, Rabbi Martins. Uh, I don't know what school of flattery we went to, but it's a pretty good school here in Germany. <laughs> uh, uh, just to pick up on the last point that Ravi made, uh, I think uh, it would be useful just to touch on those early days. But before I do, let me just first of all welcome you, Mr. President. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I'm one of those little things that hide in the corner, and somehow the Gold Association seems to find me in. Dust me out and bring me out again. A lot. <laughs> so please keep doing that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think as has already been said, today is really about Selma, her team, and the project. And I don't think we can thank you enough, and I don't think we can applaud you enough. Uh, you're absolutely right, Selma. Well, we as goals have <coughs> achieved a lot, and we are very good at achieving. What we are bad at is actually showing off. Modesty is both a strength and a weakness. And I think in the gold community it can be a weakness. What I'd like to talk about is our achievements here. Uh, Alvaro is sitting at our table. And in fact, I mean, when you go back and talk about those early days, it was in fact the likes of Alvaro and Marcus and others who set up that initial gold association who made the Gorns at ease and welcome. And I don't know, talking now really to the new generation, I don't know how many of you realize how difficult it was in the, those early days for us to settle in this country. We talk about racism nowadays, but quite frankly, you haven't seen anything yet. I came to this country, and I'm sure a lot of my compatriots here did, at a time when racism was the way of life. Trying to get a job was impossible, embarrassing. You'd see Edwards which said blacks did not apply, as blatant as that. You'd look at those little notice board in shops, looking for accommodation, and it'll say, no blacks, no Irish, and no dogs. <laughs> that is what we want to do. And that's what our community has overcome in this country. Uh, somehow, I think you're in you trouble. You've now demonstrated what you can do in terms of writing our history. What I really think we need to do is start to celebrate the golden achievements in this country here and now. There's a lot of work that we have done. We've achieved in almost every field. And again, Salma, you talk about the other communities, how they like to showcase their achievements and boast. The Indians, the Sikhs, the, and the Tamils, everybody is 
doing it. They are holding events which is celebrating Pakistani achievers, Sikh achievers. What about the Gaur achievers? I honestly think, Ravi, sure. that in the year coming up, you've got a major project to do. I think you really need to put together a project which says celebrating Gaur achievements in the UK. That would be a tremendous follow-up to the fabulous work that Tama is, uh, Selma has done on this set book. Now, let's just talk about the, the, the project and how you've contributed. Uh, like I said, yes, this is going to be a history, this is going to be our legacy, and it's going to be an inspiration, hopefully, to a lot of people. I, unfortunately, missed the exhibition, but I have followed a lot of what you do throughout the year, and I've seen what you've done on the internet. And if you haven't, colleagues, please do. You'll be amazed at what you hear, but also you'll get an insight into the amount of work that's gone into this project. Uh, I think you underplayed the amount of effort that, that has gone in. You know. But that's again another goal trait. We are very willing to give. We're very willing to support ourselves. So, well done. Okay. My job here really is to launch this wonderful project, wonderful book. I haven't rehearsed this, so I don't know what's supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to open it up, but I Say a will be once true. A will be goes on and on and on. So the goals go on and on and on. Keep doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Ravi Martins. <laughs> and Eddie, would you like to come on stage, please? Send on, please. As a token of our appreciation for all those years of effort, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together once again for Selma and Rao. Okay, Selma, please stand over here because I think so. It's not a rapid fire question, Ram. Um, I just want you to know, want to find out what's behind the name of the book, A Railway Runs True. Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's the Uganda Railway, uh, really, that uh, uh, even though uh, Gons didn't arrive there to work, uh, to build the railway, they were, uh, they were instrumental in the railway offices. And the railway actually made it possible for them to infiltrate into, um, so it practically changed their lives. Okay. What would you say was the highlight of this project? Oh my god. <laughs> oh, oh my god. I, I, there's, been, there's been so many highs, really. Uh, the book is definitely a high of mine, but. Uh, Definitely the, the exhibition was a tremendous high and so many of you were there to share it with us. So, so ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together once again.
Michael. <laughs>